Okay, can I start? Um, this is the first time I've done something like this, so we might have a few a few glitches, a few gremlins. Um, give us some feedback on um, on YouTube. Um, hang on, I've got a bit of feedback here. How's that? I see YouTube's like a like a three second delay. Um, okay, the first thing um, I thought we could maybe discuss is that uh, gliding's obviously it, it seems quite straightforward. Um, you climb up under a cloud, you glide off the rate of knots. Hopefully, do it all again. Um, Let's just see if I can share a picture here of, of something. Um, why is this not working? Um, there we go. Um, I've got a I've got a picture of a day here. It's just pretty standard homogeneous day. Um, it's pretty standard. Climb up under a under a cloud, single thermal, um, single cumulus, and glide off to the next cloud. Um, but as we know, gliding's not normally like that. Um, it's normally a lot more complicated. Um, and today we're going to try and think about some of the more complicated. Um, scenarios. Um, I think. Um, sorry, John, just to interrupt before you go on. Um, I'm not in, seeing your screen. And a spectrum, if you can think the polar opposites. So, in the picture we've got here, um, you could assume that that's standard situation. Well, actually, a standard situation would be a complete blue day. Um, individual thermals, no. Um, no convergence, no, nothing, nothing special at all. And then the extreme opposite, opposite of that is major thunderstorms. Um, I think it's easier if you start almost looking at extreme, at the extreme opposite. You look at the thunderstorms, and once you can get your head around that, um, then you can slowly work back. And then what starts to happen is you can actually see. Even in days that look very, uh, very standard and straightforward, um, you see little hints of convergence and telltales uh, that you've picked up from uh, from the, the more extreme days of the thunderstorms and so forth. Um, I might add, I think there's a very good book um, that you should read. Um, which is uh, hang on someone says there's no picture showing okay hang on um, let's try something else have we got a picture showing now uh yeah i've got it thanks john okay um, yeah, send me a send me a WhatsApp or something if you can see the picture. It's showing up for me. Yeah, there we go. Um, so there's a very good book. Um, uh, it's called uh, it's from Tom Bradbury and it's called Meteorology and Flight. Um, I would recommend that to anyone that's got any interest or passion in gliding. Uh, you need to read that book and. I think read it more than once. It's got so much good info about uh, cross country soaring, um, and a lot of the things that we're gonna we're gonna discuss tonight. Um, also, I think it's quite important that you fly in lots of different um, different environments. Um, when you fly in different environments, you you see the weather from different aspects. 
So I'm just going to show you here in, in, in one aspect is the Drakensberg. Um, let me just find that here. So this is this is on CU. So we've got the we've got the Drakens, Drakensberg Mountains. Um, El Mirador is about here somewhere. Um, and what's interesting with the Drakensberg is that we actually saw in uh, lee side conditions. Um, the sun's you can see the uh, the mouse. The sun bakes in here in the late morning and early afternoon, um, but typically the wind's actually coming uh, westerly across the top. And you would think in the face of it that it would be impossible to soar, but the sun actually um, is stronger than the wind in this case. And until I flew there, I wouldn't believe it. But now that I've flown there, you see other situations, there's places in the Alps, uh, we also realize that it's possible in the right environment. So that's one case in point is to just try and fly as many different places as you can. Um, just go up here to Orient. Um, the next thing I wanted to speak about was that an orient about here somewhere is that shear is actually a very big factor in gliding. Um, what typically happens in South Africa, I can just zoom out a bit. We've got the Drakensberg Mountains here. Uh, in, in the summertime, we essentially get a convergence uh, that forms right over the basically stretching from Vinkok up the top here you can see the arrow uh, see the mouse down to the can come to Johannesburg but it can also fluctuate pretty much the full length of South Africa depending on the conditions but what we do get is we get an easterly coming in um, comes in through the top of South Africa through Mozambique and Zimbabwe um, and comes down. And what happens at Orient, we can just go back to Orient. So here's Johannesburg here. Orient's probably about here somewhere. What we actually get is we get a low level northerly where on top the wind's actually southwesterly or westerly. This in itself uh, can really help with amazing record flights, which I'll show you just now. Um, but what it does mean is it means that uh, there's McKellysburg there, so Orient Gliding Club's just here, uh, that we have tricky conditions to start with initially. Um, and that's mainly caused by um, shear wave, uh, sorry, just shear. Uh, let me try and find something here. I'll just go up here a little bit. If you take, if you take, you call this area, say, uh, Limpopo or by extension, the Lowfeld, and then to the south of Orient is the Highfeld. Um, on a general summer's day, the temperature in uh, the low felt might be, say, 37 degrees. So we just find this. Um, we've got this diagram here. If you've got 37 degrees in the low felt, uh, the elevation is about 3,000 feet, and the air is cooling at 3, 000, uh, 3 degrees per thousand feet. If that parcel of air went up naturally as a thermal, it would, by 5,000 feet, which is the approximate height of 
orient, it would drop six degrees or down to 31 degrees. So when that parcel of air gets pushed by the a northerly wind, gets pushed up towards orient, it actually comes up and it's about 31 degrees. But what we really need is we need about 33 degrees. And that's why we, we get a delayed effect to orient itself. Thermals take an hour or so longer to start. Um, and there's one other thing as well that I think also has an effect. Um, no, I didn't actually save, a, save a, a picture of that, but it's a, it's a compression effect. So you'll have a localized inversion, um, say at 10,000 feet. You'll have this northerly wind pushing through. And as you can see, as it comes up this kind of escarpment, it, the wind literally has to go through a smaller, a smaller gap. Instead of being 7,000 feet, now it only has to go through uh, 5,000 feet. So the air actually accelerates ever so slightly. And this also has, an, uh, has some sort of effect. I haven't, I haven't figured out exactly why um, shear is bad, but I just know that whenever it occurs, it's a, it's a bad combination uh, for good soaring conditions. Just try and move here. Um, just wanted to go back to this picture here. Sorry, it's not a very big picture. But the case in point with Orient is that we have uh, a northerly lower down uh, and a southwesterly or westerly up top um, on, on a typical good Orient day. And what that does is it makes the air quite confused. Um, I'm going to try and use my building resources here to good use. So I'm going to try and do this back to front as well. So this might be a little bit tricky for me so that it's right for you guys. But essentially, this is a thermal. So when a thermal's brand new and it's strong, um, it typically goes up vertical or near vertical, um, has good momentum, um, and then you'll get a cloud. My brick is the, it's my cumulus forms on top, like so. So when you've got an orderly, the base, so in this situation where it's we're at Orient, we've got a we've got an orderly or even slight northeasterly, and then we've got a southwesterly on top. So what happens is the base of the thermal is getting dragged, but the cloud itself Let's go back here. Can you guys see that? Or must I just close this for a bit? So this is my my thermal stack. It's gone up. It's 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 vertical. And now with an orderly, with an orderly's low down up top. It's a it's a southwesterly. The base is getting pushed. To the southwest, but now the top is getting pushed to the northeast. So you start to get, and let me skew it a bit so you can see more. Looks more and more and more and more skewed. And especially if, as the thermal becomes quite old, um, it's, I'm just taking the cumulus off because it falls over, it's going to damage my keyboard. But basically, when the thermal gets quite old, you know, it gets really quite skewed. So, as a general rule, older the cloud, the more you need to pay attention to the skew. And the skew, the general rule to, to which side of the cloud is the right side to go is the upper wind side. So, don't worry about the lower level wind, worry about the upper level wind because. Upper level wind 
is basically pointing to the thermal. And this is a bit tricky. Let me just go back here now. Just show you that cloud again. So in this case, the wind could actually be from anywhere on the ground. It doesn't really matter. But the upper wind is clearly from the left of the picture here. So this this cloud is definitely saying it's pointing to the right or the left hand side of the picture. Um, and the left hand side of the cloud is the side you need to you need to to look at to investigate. And what can be really helpful is sometimes depending on the aspect. So you, you might have noticed no, notice this if you've flown across country when you fly fly in one direction. All the clouds look brilliant, and then as soon as you turn, all the clouds look rubbish or they look funny. So sometimes when I'm gliding, say I'm gliding west, I'll look to the south, I'll look to the north, I'll even look behind me to try and look at the clouds from every direction to try and look for the skew. Um, because obviously, if you're coming from one aspect, the clouds will look fantastic. And then if you look from 90 degrees, you'll see these clouds are are really being pushed over by the wind. So that gives you a hell of a, uh, a clue what you need to do. Um, but also back to what, what I was saying, is that generally, if there's any any of this shear on the ground, like we experience a lot at Orient, uh, it's a problem for gliding. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna try and get, um, Um, get sky sight up, which will be let's check this one here. This one. Okay. What I'm what we're looking at here is I've actually got the United States um, because they're in summertime and it's a it's a little bit more interesting. Um, there's more things happening uh, rather than just looking at a standard blue day in in Johannesburg. Um, but what I'm trying to trying to highlight here, um, we're actually going to look at this a few times from different scenarios. But when we consider uh, from the shear aspect, I'll just move this over a bit. If I actually zoom out, just so you guys have got some context. Uh, this is the United States. This is. The Western states, uh, Los Angeles, um, Texas is down here. Um, and typically, a summertime situation in the United States is that the air is dry and very good soaring over, over the mountains, the Western desert. And then you're getting a moist flow coming in from uh, the Gulf of Mexico comes up from Texas uh, through Texas, heading northwards, um, uh, right up and kind of swirled around to the east. And you get quite a pronounced uh, shear line here where you're getting the dry air meeting this cooler, moister air. And this is actually this. Uh, this interface is actually what produces a lot of the, um, uh, the tornadoes they have. But what I'm just trying to ex explain or demonstrate here is we could look here at um, let's do depth of thermals above ground. So 
we've got 4,000 feet above ground here and more than 10,000 feet on the, the dry side, as they call it. What you'll find is that there will be a wind. Let me find the surface wind here. You can see the surface wind also indicating um, this convergence. It's actually, essentially, it's a, a, a type of sea breeze front. But what's interesting is that further to the east, the gliding could be quite uh, could be acceptable, low. Um, obviously, on this dry side, it's very good. Um, but in this zone here, where the two meet, um, maybe for 100 kilometers or so, the wind has been accelerated by these uh, by this convergence, and it makes it almost uh, almost un unsoarable. Um, but yet, yeah, if you're just that much further to the east, it can work. And I've noticed that in even from Orient. Um, Towards the uh, the Waterberg and um, you know, north of Brits by about fifty kilometres, the the weather can be quite good. Uh, the weather's very good on the high felt. Uh, we've got uh, some sort of small interface, uh, much like this, where the air, the, the slightly cooler, moister air uh, that's come up from the low felt is meeting the high felt air. But on the face of it, looks. It's it's not unsoarable, but it's actually very difficult soaring um, to the north for a hundred kilometers. But then it picks up again, and again, I think it's it's this lower level wind that's coming in to to feed the conversion uh, the convergence, and the fact that the wind is is not in the direction of upper wind. It's it, there's shear, and this is showing. Um, this is like that standard thing when they have the uh, the stippling. And let's just look for the, the stippling. Uh, so you see here, you see they've got quite a lot of stip, uh, stippling um, to show that the thermals are weak and thermals will be very difficult as well. And that's undoubtedly been caused by the, um, the convergence there. Um, I think that's pretty much what we wanted to discuss on uh, on the shear and, and what I like to call the orient effect. We can maybe just go back to this picture here. That orient effect has a has a kind of a lesser extent um, the further south you get, uh, but it it still it still comes into play uh, into play, and if you actually look at the satellite pictures, um, Johannesburg probably sits in the best location out of anywhere because this northerly wind. Uh, low level wind is kind of prominent in the mornings. And then once the convection gets high enough, then the westerly and southerly, uh, southwesterlies take over. The biggest problem with Johannesburg is it just gets too wet. So the peak of the season is December. And by that stage, Johannesburg's had too much rain. Potch is, is pretty damn close to the, to the epicenter. And, and when I say the epicenter, if you actually look, and I'm sorry, I, I I couldn't find anything um, that I could say uh, to show, but I have seen it on the satellite photos. Um, you can actually see that the clouds basically rotate in a in a gentle anti-clockwise fashion on a on a few days a year, literally around Johannesburg as the as the focal point. So for really, really big flights, it means that 
it can be possible to almost have a tailwind for the for the whole flight. Um, and we discovered this uh, with Oscar. I discovered this with Oscar and Ace about eight years ago. It was the fifth of November, um, twenty thirteen, and we had uh, a crazy flight that we fully didn't expect, but it opened or paved the way for for other huge flights, and ultimately. The world record was done from from Poch uh, a few years ago for about 1250, uh, utilizing similar weather. But but essentially, what it means is that in the first part of the day, if I just quickly on the first leg, you can actually have crosswind. Not really a headwind, um, but once you get further to the south, we actually start to get, and you start to get higher. Uh, then you start to experience the more general weather system, which is uh, westerly, and even has a tendency to go southwesterly in the late afternoon. So you can now, from midday or from one o'clock, be experiencing tailwinds, and then later in the day, as the wind goes even more to the south, you can have a tailwind. Um, and on this day, when we came back, we kind of ended with a with a crosswind. Um, but essentially, we managed to do the whole flight without really a headwind. Uh, but the bottom legs, we had a very, very good tailwind of about 35 to 40 kph. And what that means is you can do fantastic speeds. Um, And there's a number of days when that's possible from Poch. Uh, one of the things I've noticed from Namibia is the weather's better in Namibia, but you don't seem to get this uh, wind skew, as I like to call it, that you can use to your advantage. And uh, as Lawrence gave us the, the, the breakdown on the Creedy theory a couple of weeks ago, uh, it doesn't matter how good the weather is, the thermals have to be seven, eight meters a second to do your award record, but you only need to have a 20 kph tailwind to generate the whole task. And uh, that's the difference between getting three meter average thermals and literally six meter average thermals. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look, a look at some storms. So I'll just try and show you a few things that um, that we look for in what I look for in storms and a, and, a, and a few rules that I have. Uh, I'm going to probably use my masking tape example again. Let's just see. Okay, we've got that. So when you've got a thunderstorm, you basically have, you could argue that there's two, there's two kind of scenarios where the air is like super unstable and a storm is like a hair trigger waiting to go. Or you could have a situation where the air is slightly stable. I mean, it's still unstable enough. The, the Cape values are enough that you can have storms. But you get a good kind of convergence area, which generates uh, some clouds that hang around in an area. They grow up and then eventually one of it grows, grows much bigger um, and makes makes a big, a big thunderstorm like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and. I'm going to try and go from this picture and then back to our, um, our masking tape example again. So we're just going to go here so if you can see me now. Um, I'm going to use this, this brick as our thermal, thermal source. I'll try and move this down so you can see that. 
I probably needed to do this earlier as well. So you from the from the previous one on the wind shear. But this is this is your hot zone in the ground. So this is heated up. So then when it's sufficiently hot enough and it's it's convergence area, we get our our nice big thunderstorm cloud has grown up, but it's it's a fresh cloud. It's not, you know, it hasn't had a chance to to what I like to call um, go to the, the secondary effect. So this is just one big cloud. Um, I'm going to assume that the wind is coming from 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 the west here. So hopefully that's indicating a westerly for you guys. So I'm going to show that as a westerly. So this this cloud kind of grows up, gets quite mature, and it starts to to kink as the the upper wind coming this side has an effect on it. As I say again, again, it doesn't really matter what the wind's doing on the ground. The the the, the upper wind in this scenario is is the key to tell you to tell you where you need to be. So now this big cloud is actually starting to get pushed by the upper wind here. It's leaning over a bit. It's looking really fantastic. It's leaning over. And it's coming across like so. It starts to rain. So imagine half of our hot source is wet now. Um, and I'm going to come to a policy on that just now. But basically, this cloud gets pulled across. And eventually, this, this cloud's kind of over here somewhere. It's well past our, our zone. And, and half our zone is wet. So the only part that can actually make the thermal is, is, is well, well upwind of the upper wind. So it, it actually is not really connected with the cloud anymore. And, and this is the situation where a lot of people find themselves in that the cloud looks absolutely fantastic. It looks like it's going five meters per second plus, but when you get there, you get that little pop of lift and then a bit of turbulence and that's it. And basically it's just, you're too late. Essentially the cloud itself has, has been pushed, pushed across its own contaminants. It's, it's, it's destroyed the ground underneath now. So, and that's what I call the, the secondary effect. So this is now where we need we need something else now for this cloud to work. Um, so let me try and take us back to our picture. Okay, so this is um, you know, disregard this 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 little bit on the left. Um, but but this is what I would call a a fresh cloud. It's grown up. It's got nice and sprightly. Um, as long as you're you're fast enough, you know, it'd be safe to say that I don't know what this is, but you know, the good zone is down here somewhere. And I would say this this is gonna stay stay sound for some time before this cloud basically gets pushed across to the left hand side of the picture, judging by um by what the upper wind's doing. This here as I say, it's, it, it's difficult. This is just some picture I've downloaded off the internet. Uh, but looking at these little bits of tendrils here, this this could have been outflow from another storm that's actually made this this storm develop. So in which case, this would be the precedent. And then uh, the storm itself would actually get pushed this way. But yeah, I'm just hypothesizing. Um, this is this is kind of on the verge of of where we've got a large cloud, large 
overdeveloped cumulus cloud, and now it's on the verge of going to the, the secondary effect, which is, I'm actually going to go past that picture, which is now when we get the outflow from the storm. So all that air that's gone up in the storm, you look at this picture here. So I don't know why I can't make this bigger. Sorry. But all this air that's basically gone up is now coming down. Um, and the storm itself is is kind of get, getting this perpetual motion going now. So this air that's coming down, cascading down, if you imagine it's like a like a hose aiming at the ground, it's bouncing off the ground, and then it's radiating out. And this cold air as it as it radiates out is pushing up the warm air in front of it. Uh, and that's what's happening here. This this cold air is coming down here somewhere, it's coming, coming, coming out of the picture towards us. And pushing the, the warm air in the um, up the front here, um, and when you encounter this, the soaring can be, can be very very good. I'm actually, going to go now just back to sky sight. I'm going to show one of my favorite pages on SkySide is actually the you know, convergence page. I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. So we can see this is this cool air that's come up from the Gulf of Mexico and then all this here, uh, when you see this on SkySight, this is really, really, really good. You know, you can plan huge flights when it's looking like this. This is really acceptable. Um, just want to go to thermals. So there was a bit of a thunderstorm that I spotted here that I just wanted to. So basically, these two two parts here are the two thunderstorms or large overdevelopments that are growing. I do the, the play function. So this is the height of convection. Oh, sorry. We're going to have to wait for it to, to regenerate now. Might have to do one full, full run through. Let's try now from about one o'clock. So you can actually see these two thunderstorms, and you can actually see this these zones radiate out from I go back here. So for example, this one here. Let's go back. This one here. That storm's probably around here somewhere, but all this here is the cool air that's radiating out from the storm. And it's killing this whole area is is, is dead. So once this this cool air goes through, there's there's no chance to get a thermal. And what I wanted to show was if we look at scoot uh, like here is very good so let's put the scoot in this 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 zone here i mean this is fantastic this is probably not enough for clouds but it's looking like more than twenty thousand feet so that is a really really a really great day um, if we move this, what I want to do is I want to move this close enough that 
Let's try it there. Okay. I actually want to kind of try and show you as the cool air. So this is this is this point at three o'clock. It's looking phenomenal. Not quite moist enough for, for clouds. Close. Four o'clock still okay. Five o'clock, or well, hopefully we get there just before dark. We just go back here. Um, yeah, we might need to move that. You could just see that we actually got some clouds there. You know, the, the smallest amount of cumulus started forming at about um, uh, 5.30. We'll just keep playing. Uh, sorry, we're going to have to. We're gonna to have to go a bit closer. We ran daylight ended before we had a chance to put it there. Okay. What, what I'm trying to show you is, as you can see, this little little tongue of of of, uh, of cooler air, and you can actually just see in the in the labs right here, there's a small bucket that's formed now. So this is this problem is it's right on dark. So like here, it's fine. Yeah, you, know, you you would see it. You would see that the 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 storm front or the the the, the dust front or gust front has actually passed this point, and that's what this is showing is this slight cooling of air. Uh, you'll probably find it's more pronounced than that, and this huge increase in wind speed as well at the lower levels. As soon as that happens, there is literally zero chance. Of getting a thermal. So, I mean, in this area, the air was good for more than 20,000 feet. As soon as this tongue of cold air goes through, there is no more thermals. There's nothing. You could be up here, you could be at 20,000 feet, but it could take quite literally half an hour for a week of thermals to still ascend that kind of distance. So, you could be soaring in something that's left the ground a, you know, a good half an hour ago. But new thermals, nothing, nothing at all. So that's something to bear in mind is that this outflow from the storm, once it's gone through an area, it kills the area. And it basically doesn't, in, in the South African context, it doesn't regenerate. Um, I think in the very cool climates, like if you're flying in Sweden and Scandinavia, um, it does you do have the possibility of you could get something going through in the early afternoon and it could regenerate in the afternoon. But in South Africa, the amount of energy required to get a 20,000 foot cloud base, um, it just doesn't regenerate. So, and even if you if you get these storms, it, it actually seems if you get them during daylight hours, you could, you could get a, a storm that comes through at nine o'clock. So even before you've got a, a proper um, even general convection, you get something uh, disturbance that comes through, and it just leaves this cool air that that it just doesn't get hot enough um, that the day can be viable. Um, There's a couple of there's a couple of golden rules that I like to I like to abide by. So the first thing that we talked about is if the ground the ground's wet, we also get that. Let me move our Tiffy gram there. So here, I mean, look at this. This is this is bad. 
this is three o'clock. We should be we should be cooking with gas. Nothing is happening. So wet ground, and and I'm and I'm speculating that that is um, the thunderstorm itself. That is the actual rain component. So wet ground is finished. As soon as the ground's wet, it's done for the day. The second thing that we we've, we've just discussed is the outflow. So if you've had any outflow, any outflow for the, for the day, that area is also toast. So you almost need to think, and it's kind of it seems counterintuitive for, uh, for, for for storm flying, but all the hints are actually on the ground. Um, Quite often, unless you're right up at the clouds, the clouds are giving you um, old information. Now, the problem is there's so much wind shear. Um, the winds are quite strong. The upper winds get pulled down. But everything's getting mixed up. And if you're less than, say, a few thousand feet below base, you're, you're using very old information uh, if you're looking up at the clouds. Uh, at what you need to do. Sometimes in the right scenario, they're, they're, they're golden. Don't get me wrong, but in many situations, you could look at this and you'll you'll say, if it works on the ground, you'll look above, and maybe there's good clouds above, then the situation's doubly confirmed. It's It's good to go. Other times, you'll see that it works on the ground, and then half an hour later, the clouds are there. Um, so you can, you're kind of seeing into the future, you're kind of guessing what's going to happen. But, but essentially, what I'm trying to say is that if you think of the ground as a big chessboard, and then that's or, or or a big Excel spreadsheet that's broken into a whole other cells. Once that cells either got got wet or it's had cold air then that cell is neutralized that cell is finished so if you can picture in your mind everything that's been affected by the storm to that extent you end up with a whole lot of cells that uh, are closed that are no good and then you're left with the cells that are good and this thing's in flux and you can see which way the winds are blowing, or you can extrapolate which way the the, the outflow is blowing. Um, then you can kind of predict where you need to be. And quite often, like if you see uh, winds, um, that comes to the other point: is winds to the storm are good, winds from the storm are bad. But winds from the storm are fine as long as you are flying on basically where the winds are, are meeting, where the winds end. Um, confused. But um, but yeah, think, think about it. You've got all this cold air, and all you're trying to do is you're just trying to guess where the cold air has been. And cold air could be rain, and, and you know that once there's been cold air, it's no good. And then you just gotta you just gotta try and guess where is that cold air going. And if you fly on the edge of that cold air, um, just stay on the edge. Uh, many times I've managed to find that that cold air, and I've gone to to great distances, uh, well off track. Sometimes I think on one. One competition on Mr. 100 kilometers, 90 degrees off track, uh, because I realized that was the only option I had to find where that cold air is meeting, uh, or interfacing with the general air of the day. So, and the, and the air of the day is your normal air that's been heated, heated normally, and it doesn't actually matter if it's in cloud, shadow, or whatever, as long as that air hasn't been cooled. It's still unstable enough that it will go up, provided that it's got this cold air pushing against it. So you get these lines that you can that you can run along. 
um, let's go back to this picture. This one here. So you, you get this, and this is, and this is what, I mean, this is awesome if you get it. It's really fantastic. But as I was saying, many times I've found where that cold air is coming, and you don't even have these clouds forming. You actually start climbing in this area, and then the cloud forms above you. Um, so you almost predicted where the cloud was going to come. So, but again, that is the key is to realize what's happening on the ground. Um, and just to know that if it's wet or there's wind on the ground, you're not going to get a thermal there. Um, there's a few extra bits and bits and bobs that you could discuss with how you can feel in the air, but that's kind of almost needs to be done done in practice because sometimes you can actually feel the this front going through, and you, you almost have to center it like wave. Um, it seems quite obvious once you've done it a couple of times, but but initially it it it's, it seems like voodoo when you first do it. Um, I just want to check that we've got these 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 tips. So if the wind's blowing from the storm, and now you're flying towards that wind, that's you're flying into to to dead air. If there's still wind going towards the storm. Then that typically means that the storm, the outflow hasn't actually hasn't pushed away from the storm yet. So that air is probably okay. Um, if you have to land out and you're in doubt of as to which way you should land, always land towards the storm. I had a an instance uh, at a Grand Prix about it was actually a rest day, and I thought I thought I'd be clever and do the task, but landed straight away anyway. Um, and fortunately, I made the decision to land towards the storm. Uh, there was almost no wind. And on round out, I actually flew into the gust front. So, and at least then I was aiming pretty much into the wind. It was, it lifted me up and felt like I could have actually just about got away again. But, um, but at least because I was flying towards where I thought any danger could come from, I was, the glider was in the right aspect, so it was a relatively safe landing. If I was flying any other direction, um, it could have been uh, a major issue. Um, just want to check. So, yeah, just, um, just if you ever get that situation again when you're flying in storms, Try and think about what I've said with the ground. Um, think where hasn't it been wet? Where hasn't the, the wind been? Where's the interface between what's been contaminated by the storm with the wind or uh, cold air or, or rain, and uh, the air that's just been naturally warm by the day? If you can find that interface, or you can kind of guess where that interface is then generally the gliding will be very good. And especially if you're low, um, it's always a good uh, to go to place. If you're low and you're in have a wet ground or you're in the wind from the storm, then there's no point even thinking that you're going to get away because you, you know, the, the day is finished for you. Even if you're at 5,000 feet, I've had instances where I've, I've flown into the outflow, even at 5,000 feet, and I just know, boom, there's, there's, there's no chance now. So you can just uh, plan ahead and make the safest landing possible. Um, I wanted to go to now was actually to discuss uh, Seabreeze fronts, which are kind of an extension of storms. Um, as I said earlier, the, the key is to try and get your mind around um, the extremes. And so if you can get your mind around storms, 
then you can get your mind easily around sea breezes and then you can start to see small sea breezes and then the smallest little convergences and then then you can see even in blue days you can see the the smallest little um, effects of convergence and so on um, but we're just going to consider like a general proper convergence today um, and i wanted to show you this was actually uh, this is from Stefan Langer uh, flying in New Zealand so in Auckland uh, he was flying from Auckland in Auckland we get a lot of um, a lot of uh, um, convergences uh, we've got the sea on just well, every side we have the sea and you can see in this instance here, you've got the main cloud base. So in this case, on the right hand side, you just have a general cloud base for the day. On the left here, this cool moist air is coming in, um, probably off the Tasman Ocean, I'm speculating in this case. And as it slowly comes inland, it's pushing up. The warmer air in front of it and so you're essentially flying in this this little crevasse or this knee um, and if you actually check this and you can fast forward this and play this at home in your own time you'll actually see these dag clouds uh, rising up quite quickly to show the the strength of of the uh, of the convergence, um, this one. Uh, I don't know. So you can see these these clouds here are actually forming as he's flying along. So this he, he's gone right around the task, and I think this is on the other side of the island now. And now he's actually got the air coming in from the Pacific side. So the previous shot was on coming in from the west, and now this is coming from coming in from the east. But as I say, it's uh, you, the resolution is probably not so good. Um, Google it, and then you can check that at home in your own time. Um, Yeah, I thought I also had a uh, share wave that we could discuss, but maybe we can do that another time because I see I see we've been we've been going for an hour already. Which is probably probably enough for you guys. Um I just wanna I wanna show you something to finish off with. It's actually got nothing to do with with um with gliding, it's actually a guy from paragliding. His name's uh, Sebastian Benz, but he does YouTube videos, and I'm going to show you here. He just does the videos and fast forward, um, for basically time lapse, and then he narrates over the top, which I think is fantastic. Uh, you can, I think, I've watched all his videos, and. The fact that he's flying a paraglider is actually better because he loses altitude quite quickly and then he has to gain altitude again, you know, the next range. So it's so it's technical. Um, so you're seeing all the places that and he's describing you know, what you're looking for. Look, it's mainly it's mainly in an alpine sense, but but I think it's it's really really well done, and um, I don't know why more gliding guys don't do this. Um, and it's nice because you can actually see when he's gliding, when he's gliding between the clouds, you can see uh, this cloud's growing quite nicely, so that one should be quite good. And yeah, you can 
you can see a full flight and maybe learn a few things in only a few minutes rather than spending four hours or I, I don't know what, what this thing that these guys put this these longest glide flights out. But yeah, that's it. Anyone? Um, maybe you can send some questions on YouTube or whatever if you're just as confused about it as I am. But yeah, maybe we can do another one on, um, on look about ShareWave or some other some other aspects. But yeah, the only way to get better is to to fly a lot, to fly in different and difficult places, fly when the weather's difficult, fly when the weather's tricky. Um, people probably notice that I like to fly when it's not standard because it, it, it's interesting. It's, you know, I've, got, I've got theories and ideas in the back of my mind and when the weather's tricky, it, 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 it's another opportunity for me to see, okay, my theory is correct. It's validated or something's wrong needs tweaking. Um, so yeah, fly in difficult weather. And as I say, every place you fly, you learn something, you learn something different. Fly in the Drakensberg, you learn something. You fly in Cape, you learn something. You fly overseas, you learn something. Um, uh, there's, uh, I can't emphasize enough actually, that's probably, probably the, the biggest key that I had to my gliding is that I got to fly in a lot of different places. And if you look at all the top ranked pilots, the likes of Sebastian Kawa, they fly all over the show. And again, that just helps validate their ideas and theories to be correct. Cool. Till next time.